And so you can open up to Romans chapter 12. But in the year of 1918, over in France, this is during World War I, there was an American army brigade trapped in a trench. They were trapped under heavy machine gun fire during a battle. Private Nicholas Palermo decided to sacrifice his own life to save others. Facing three machine gun teams, Palermo left the trench and was able to take out the German soldiers manning two of the guns before being killed, an action that later rewarded him with the Silver Star for valor during battle. You know, just a really quick story about a guy who was in the trench with his army brothers and found himself in a situation where there's nothing really to do. Somebody's got to do something. And we all hear stories like this about war, and we all, of course, are living, you guys are growing up in the age of superhero movies. Um, and, you know, who do you think, how many of you think that uh, Thor is the best superhero in, in the Marvel Universe? Wow, that few? The hammer's so cool, though. Um, anyway, how many of you think that Captain America is the best? Okay. How, how many Iron Man fans? Okay, okay. Um, all right, Black Panther. Uh, Black Widow. Like, there's not an overwhelming favorite I'm getting here. Spider Man. <laughs> okay, all right. All right, well, let's talk about Spider Man for a minute. You know, there's similar things about Spider-Man, right? Of course, he's a superhero. He's not like Nick Pal uh, Palermo that really had no superhero powers. He wasn't, uh, um, he wasn't uh, a Captain America running through that battlefield. And uh, if you read more of that story, you'd realize that after he hopped out of the trench, all three machine gun teams aimed their fire towards him, and he had bullets flying all around him. And by the time he took out the first machine gun team, on his way to the second machine gun team, he got hit several times. And so, wounded, he still made his way over to that second machine gun team. Being wounded, took out that second machine gun team and started making his way towards the third one all by himself before actually taking enough bullets to where he just couldn't move on and his life was taken. And uh, so, he was awarded a great medal. So, Spider-Man and Nick Palermo on different parts of the multiverse, I guess you could say. Uh, just totally different categories, right? True heroism versus something in, in Hollywood. But let's talk about Spider-Man for a minute. I mean, how many times, how many times can someone uh, just fall from a building or be thrown by a villain and Spider-Man just swoops in right at the last second, right, just to save that person? Uh, MJ, how many times in all the different superhero uh, series has she been thrown off of a building, thrown from heights, or fallen off somewhere, and Spider-Man said to save her, um, right? So MJ's always in peril. She's always getting thrown around, always about to meet her doom. But Spider-Man swoops out of nowhere and immediately saves her, right? So guys, we're all very familiar with stories of heroism. We're all very familiar with stories of... Um, I'm going to move this because I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to knock it over. Um, we're all familiar with all these stories of people giving and sacrificing and going the extra mile for others, right? And so we're not, we're, that idea isn't foreign to us. Now, as we get into Romans 12, 1 and 2, it's not necessarily exactly the same uh, because when we, when, we are, when we give ourselves as a living sacrifice, as Romans 12, 1 it tells us, it doesn't end up with us getting mowed down by a machine gun team uh, or, or what have you. Uh, but just to kind of get ourselves in the right frame of mind when it comes to living sacrifice. So Romans 12, 1, let's read this together when he was uh, gracious enough to uh, say that. But I, I appeal, I'm going to be reading from the ESV in case you have a different uh, translation there. Um, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So what is a living sacrifice? What is a living sacrifice? As we look back, we see where Paul was writing this letter to the Romans, right? We, we see where he was writing this letter, and, and uh, you know, there was 
uh, obviously some rulers in Rome who, who, who got tired of the Christians and threw them out of the country and then welcomed them back. And, and Nero was even one of those where he kicked them out and then he welcomed them back and then he ultimately turned on them again. And uh, so that was kind of the state here uh, in, in Rome when Paul wrote this letter. And so he was writing to these, these Christians, not only uh, Jewish Christians, uh, uh, believing Jews, but also Gentiles as they were part of this Roman church. And so the word sacrifice was not, uh, was not odd to this, this church group. They knew very well what a sacrifice was. They were very familiar with Jewish tradition. They were very familiar with uh, the, the uh, ceremonies at the tabernacle, the Old Testament. They, they were very familiar with all of this. It wasn't foreign to them, so he didn't need to elaborate. Um, but th there's a little bit of difference between the sacrifices that the Jews were used to and a living sacrifice. Does anybody know? Can anybody tell me what the difference here is? What's the difference? So a regular sacrifice was to make amends for sin. Right. And a living sacrifice is to go out and live with the God as a living sacrifice and not as a burnt offering. Okay, good. I like that. Who else has another thought? What's the difference between a sacrifice as the Jews practiced it versus the term living sacrifice? How could that throw us off a little bit? Okay. Good. I like that. Anybody else? Yeah, back here. Oh, sorry. I need to like toss around a microphone here. I want to just minute. What do you think? Yeah. Nice. Hey, that, and, and, that's, and that's perfect because uh, what she was just saying, I like all of what you said, guys, so nobody was wrong. Um, but the difference here is that sacrifices as the Jews knew it, the animal was dead when they lit the fire, right? The animal was already dead. Um, but the, the terminology here is a little bit different, right? A, a living sacrifice. Something that's not dead, right? Of course, we, are, we can go back in the first 11 chapters of Romans and talk about how we're supposed to be dead to sin and the old man and the old nature. But this term living sacrifice is worth us just kind of looking into. So let's, let's turn to 1 Kings really quick. 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings chapter 18. Paul is doing more than just, you know, trying to display the idea of giving yourself to something, is giving a part of yourself to something. 1 Kings chapter 18, starting in verse 36, this is a familiar story of Elijah up on Mount Carmel, right? He goes up against the prophets of Baal. Totally cool story if you've never read it before. If you've never heard it, you need to read the, need, need to read the whole story. But we're going to start in verse 36. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And then when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. So just want to bring your focus to the word consumed. So Paul was doing more than just conveying the idea of giving yourself to something or, or giving up something for somebody else or for something else. When he's talking about living sacrifice, this familiar practice that, of the Jews, and obviously they knew this story as well. But this living sacrifice is when we are just totally consumed with something. What is that something that Paul is telling us that we need to be totally consumed with? Go ahead and say it. It's not a trick question. With our Father, with our Creator, right? We're supposed to, we're supposed to be totally consumed with the one who sent Jesus to die for us, right?
I want you to turn to, we're going we're gonna to go through some verses here, and then we'll, we'll stop flipping through so much. Romans 3.23. Her life is supposed to be totally consumed with Jesus. And why is this? Because when we give our life to the Lord, our life is not our own. Our life is not our own. And he's already said this over and over again in the book of Romans. So let's go to Romans 3 and 23. He's already said this so many times here in this letter. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by His blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in His divine forbearance He had passed over the former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Turn to chapter 5, verse 2. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into his grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Chapter 5, verse 8. But God shows His love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by His blood, much more shall we we be saved by Him from the wrath of God. Chapter 6, verse 4. It says, We were buried, therefore, with Him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Chapter 7, verse 4. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. Chapter 8, verse 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons. Verse 37, same chapter. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, chapter 11, verse 11. He says, So I ask, did they they stumble in order that they might fall? By no means, rather, through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles so as to make Israel jealous. Now, if their trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? All these were things that he was teaching this group of Christians, this group of believers, that you are not your own. Living sacrifice means that we're not our own. Now, we're not our own. (coughs) You know, um, as part of as part of my job, I, I travel um, quite a bit, not quite a bit, about 25% of the time I travel. And I have for quite some time, even with a previous job. And I remember, I remember at one point, there, there's been several times when I've traveled that I've, 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 there's been fear. Um, I'll, share, I'll share a few stories uh, while I'm with you today. But um, one story in particular was I fly a lot. I was in a plane. It's never bothered me. I've never been scared to fly. Um, but there was this one flight, this one time, when I was just overcome with fear of what if this plane goes down and what if I don't make it back? By this point, I had already flown hundreds of thousands of miles. And, but for some reason, this one flight, I was just scared. I was like, what is my wife and my kids going to do if, if I die? I was so scared about what uh, my kids growing up without a dad around. I was so scared about what would happen uh, to the house and the bills and, and all these things and them living in poverty. I mean, I was just, I was just overcome with so much fear about, man, what if, what if I die? What if today's my last day? Anybody ever come overcome with fear like that? Anybody ever fear for your life or at least fear if you're just overcome with something? Just all of a sudden, don't know where it came from. But you know, the Lord worked through that. And I remember sitting on the plane. I remember actually having a song um, going through my head. A couple of songs, but one of them um, was I Am Not Alone. I think it's a Carrie Job song. Um, That's a song, I Am Not Alone. 
And that song came to mind, and I actually had it downloaded on my phone, so I remember playing that in those moments of fear. And in that moment, when I was in fear, riding on that whatever kind of plane it was, what could I have done to keep that plane from going down? Okay, you guys are being super spiritual. You can pray. No, physically, what could I do as David Owens to keep that plane from going down? Absolutely nothing. I could not. Listen, as many video games as I played growing up, flying fighter jets, all those kind of things, as much as I did, I probably couldn't fly that plane and land it safely if those pilots were incapacitated. Couldn't do that. Uh, there's nothing that uh, if something physically went wrong with the plane, and damn it, I couldn't have gone down to fix it and been that hero like you would probably expect to see in the movies, somebody crawling underneath the underbelly of the plane. And, um, there's nothing I could do. So, in essence, my life was not my own. There's nothing I could do to change the outcome of that flight. It was either going to land or it was going to crash. And I had no part to play in that. I just got on the plane, right? My life was not my own. And that's a, maybe a silly little example, but at the same time, it sounds kind of negative, but it's not meant to be. But it's just a reminder and a, a, a way for us to put, our mind, put a framework in our mind about how our life, when we surrender it to the Lord, is not ours, it's His. But it comes to a really important point here that if you're taking notes, if you're a note taker, I'm not really a big point giver, okay? I'm not really a, hey, here's your first point, here's your second point. But I'll give you a statement here that your father is trustworthy. Your father is trustworthy. So as we reread chapter 12, verse 1, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual Worship. Some of your translations might say reasonable service. And what that means, it's only logical. So Paul outlines this amazing story in chapters 1 through 11. He talks about, um, he really paints a beautiful picture of how, hey, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. It doesn't matter if we do really terrible outward things or if we, if we struggle with uh, internal things in our mind and our heart. Um, we're, we're all the same. We're all sinners, right? We're all in need of a Savior. We, there's nothing we can do ourselves to find sanctification, to find justification. We, there's nothing we can do in ourselves. So he's painting this beautiful picture, and then we get to this point where after he just got done teaching the church at Rome, hey, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. All these great, wonderful promises that we look to and we share with people uh, when we share the gospel with them. All these amazing things. And then he gets to this point where he says, hey, now on top of that, he's not saying, hey, here's, here's a side note that some of you may choose to do. Hey, hey here's, here's something that is a recommendation, but, you know, don't take it. No, he's, he's like, hey, I beseech you is how some translations. Now, what that means is like, I implore you, I beg you to, to offer your life as a living sacrifice. Recognize that your life is not your own. Now, some of you, that may make you uncomfortable to recognize that you are not the master of your uh, total master of your whole life in every way. But giving over control. None of us want to give over control of our body or ourself or our life totally over to somebody else. From a fleshly perspective, that can be uncomfortable, right? We want to make the, our decisions for ourselves. We want to make decisions for our own life, for our own future. There's a lot of messages that come in from the world, too, and from social media that tell us otherwise as well. But coming back to that first point is your father can be trusted. Our creator is trustworthy. You know, so after all this amazing stuff that, hey, we confess our sins uh, we surrender our life to Christ. We believe that Jesus raised, uh, uh, was raised from the dead on the third day. And uh, we believe that we receive that. It's only logical that we just give ourself as a living sacrifice to the Lord. It's only logical. After all he's done. Now I'm getting somewhere, so we're still building a foundation here. Stick with me. So, verse number two, well, let's finish up with verse number one, sorry. Your spiritual worship, your reasonable service. 
Pastor Jeffrey talked about that closet last night. Anybody talk about the closet during your small group time today? <laughs> Anybody talk about the secret closet? I love that analogy. It's a perfect analogy about, hey, we clean everything else, that we have this closet, right, that we want to that we just shove everything. Maybe it's the junk drawer. Maybe it's not a whole closet. Maybe it's just that drawer in your room. I see some smiles. That drawer maybe in the kitchen where it's just kind of like anything random just throws in there. Maybe it's under your bed. Maybe that's your closet uh, where just everything else goes. You know, um, in our house we have a light that is on all the time. It's a light that's on over the sink. And that is kind of something that has always been in our old house. We always had a light on over the sink. And that light was facing the main road, the kitchen was. And so since that light was on, the blinds were always open, the windows were always open. So really, that part of our house, we didn't want there to be any craziness going on because it was very visible. Right? It was very visible to everybody driving by. Small little uh, uh, neighborhood. The road was really close to the house. So really, someone could just put their brakes on and just be quite close to us and wave hi. Probably could roll their window down and have a conversation with us behind our kitchen sink. I mean, it wasn't that far away. So you wanted to keep it neat and nice and tidy and clean. You didn't want to make it dirty and all cluttered up, right? So same thing. The things that people can see, we want to keep clean and in order. We want, we want to be rending our garments, right? We want, we want to, uh, those outward things to look like they're okay. But see, that closet, those are the things that will keep us from really saying, God, my, my life is yours. I give, I give you my life. I don't, just, I don't just trust you, God, with my, my eternity, but I trust you with my body. I trust you with my life today. And think about that for a minute. We are really good about trusting God with our eternity. Like, God, I trust you to keep me out of hell and bring me to heaven. Really, that's as simple as it's put when we just kind of accept his gift of salvation. God, we trust you with that. Confident. I know it. Fall asleep. At, uh, it. I lay my head down on my pillow at night. I know that God's got me for eternity. But we don't trust him with today. We don't trust him with our life today. We don't trust him with our dreams today. We don't trust him with our plans after high school today. We don't, we, don't, we don't trust him in those elements. We have a hard time letting go of that. Remember, our Father is trustworthy. So sometimes that not wanting to lose control or even sin in our life can keep us from that total surrender, can keep us keeping the door of that closet closed can keep us from giving every part of ourself to the Lord, holding one part back. And that's what Paul is talking about when, and as we read in 1 Kings, it's about being totally consumed with our Savior, being totally consumed at what He did for us. Now, I know that there's also fear in our life about not being able to live a normal life, right? Because if, I, if I'm crazy about Jesus, then I'm going to be the weird one I'm not going to be able to do anything fun. I'm not going to be able to go anywhere cool. I'm not going to be able to follow my dreams. I'm, I'm not. We have a lot of fear about giving those things up. But our Father's trustworthy. So what do you fear today? What are you worried about giving up? What are you worried about giving up? Are you, are you worried that God's going to take something away from you? Are you worried that God's going to take a dream away from you? Because if I surrender it to him, he might just take it away. So I'm just I'm going to keep this little one for myself because this is really important to me. I'm going to tell you a little story about my oldest child. She's here in the room, but she's heard this story before. So it's not going to embarrass her too bad. But when I was a new father, um, we had our little baby at home. And when we left the hospital, me and my wife were both, you know, as new parents were, okay, what do we do now? Here's, here's this kid. We've got, we've like got to keep this kid alive now. And, you know, we've, we've got to like do some stuff for this kid. And, and we're like looking at the nurses and we're saying, which one of you is going to come home with us? Because we've not done this before. 
Um, so, you know, there was some fear and there was some anxiety about that. But, you know, we got home and, you know, we've kept her alive for 15 years. Thank the Lord. And, and so that's good. Um, yeah, thank, thank you. Um, but here, here's the thing. Um, I remember when she was still, for, for the first, like, eight weeks, we just kind of transitioned her from, like, a, a sleeping in our room in a, in a crib and started transitioning her over to, our other, uh, to her own room and, and things like that. Um, there was a moment where I was, I was praying over her. And I remember it so clearly that this is my little girl, loved her so much, would not only die for her, but I would kill for her. I mean, this little tiny baby that hasn't been with us, but just for a couple of weeks, loved her so much that I was just like, God, thank you for this wonderful gift in our family. And my heart was wanting to say, God, she's yours. She is yours. Take her and use her for your glory. I remember wanting to say those words. But I remember not being able to get them out. I remember it as clear as it is today. I, had the, I couldn't get the words out. That was a part of me that I didn't trust God with. And how, how foolish and arrogant I was to think that I could do a better job of taking care of her than God. And it's not just that. Why in the world would... It was just, for me, God revealed the sin in my life of not only self-righteousness, but a lack of trust in Him. I trusted Him with heaven, but I couldn't trust Him with my little girl. It was, oh, I didn't trust my Heavenly Father. There was a part of me, and after examining that, it was like, God, if I give her to you, are you going to take her? Are you going to do something terrible in her life to, like, just humble me? And I can't help but think that there's areas in all of our life where we're thinking, God, if I give this up for you, you're going to take it from me. If I, sacri- if I open this door to this closet, God, you're going to do something terrible in my life to try to get my attention. We have a gracious and loving Heavenly Father who can be trusted. He loves us so much. He's promised us good success. Now, are there terrible things that happen? Yes. Are there, unfortunately, are there stories where, and you probably know them, and there might be even those of you in this room today where a parent has had to bury a child. And that's heartbreaking. We live in a fallen world. We live in a sinful world. Fallen creation. Terrible things happen. Tragedies happen. Tragedies will happen. But just because tragedies happen does not mean that God is not trustworthy with the outcome. So what it is in your life, what's in that closet that you're not willing to open up and shed light on? Is it your future? Do you have a dream of a career, dream of something you want to do outside of school, and you're just not, God, I'm not going to surrender that to you because I'm I'm worried that you might not let me do it. So I just encourage you to take that to the Lord and just tell him, he already knows. He already knows it's there. Just take it to the Lord and say, God, I'm having trouble trusting you with this. Pastor Jeffrey talked about the word confession last night. I love learning about confession. It wasn't really until these last few years of my adult life that I really understood what confession was. Confession for me was, yeah, just list off the sins to God that I have in my life, right? But it's really important for us to call things what God calls them. You know, Pastor Jeff talked about that last night in saying things specifically. Don't just, don't be general with God. He already knows. He already knows your heart. He already knows where you're at. And look at how gracious and loving He's being to us every day. He loves us so much. He's got great plans for you. And guys, He can be trusted. Living life completely consumed with our Savior is a good plan of a good God. 
God's best for you. Just think about this. How many of you want God's best for you? You want God's best for you? If you didn't raise your hand, I appreciate your honesty. Maybe you're saying, maybe I don't even know Jesus. Listen, you're in a great place right now. Maybe you think, I don't know if I can trust God. I appreciate your honesty. But if you want God's best for you, God's best for you is waiting when we are completely consumed with Him. Verse number two, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So let's look at this word conform for just a quick moment. So don't be conformed to the world. Conf confirmation. Listen, you and me, every one of us, we're all conf we are all conformed to something. I think we live in an age where everybody wants to be unique. Everybody wants to be um, like, like find the song that nobody else has heard before. And we want to share it with everybody before anybody else shares it. We want to be the one that gets into a new show before anybody else does. We, we want to be independent in our own thing. And we want to uh, paint our own picture and display who we are. Guys, I'm not, I'm not saying and preaching against that. Okay. And guess what? You are unique. You are, because God created you exactly how he wants you. And you aren't different than every other person that he's created. He's given you special gifts, which we will read here in just a few verses. He's given every single one of you special gifts that he wants you to use. So you are unique. But the point is, is that let's not be so arrogant as to think that we are a nonconformist. We're all conforming to something. And what Paul is imploring us here is don't be conformed to the world. What is he saying here? You start looking into the, different, the definitions of all these words, and I think it's Kent Hughes that puts it this way. What Paul is saying is don't be pulled into the evil schemes of this age. Don't be pulled into the schemes of this age. When I say an evil scheme of this current age, think of our current day right now. What are we in? Gen Alpha now I think we're in? Gen Alpha? Um, I'm waiting for the Gen Alpha Dictionary, by the way. Um, you know, I think, I think the Gen Alpha Dictionary will be lit. You think? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. I had to do it. I had to do it. No, that was bad. That was bad. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, we're like in Gen Alpha now, right? Um, and, you know, we're all looking at, let me ask you this. When it comes to the evil schemes of this age, what comes to mind? When Paul's saying, don't be pulled into this, what's something in this age that we can be pulled into or are being pulled into? Social media, good. What else? Hmm? Video games. Video games. Oh. <laughs> Ouch, man. TV shows, good. What else? Say it out loud. Crypto. Oh my. That's some. I have no advice for you about crypto. I'm not into that. Music, good. Somebody help me out with some volume. Yes, good. The LBGTQ agenda. What else? Hmm? What's that? Well, I was just like saying, you know, like normal politics. Okay. Yeah. No, that's not what you said. <laughs> Black Lives Matter. Okay. Hey, hey, dude. Hey. It's all right. Hey, you're all right. Hey, guys, all these things and poli politics, political things, stuff, guys, there's a lot of schemes pulling at us trying to get our attention. How many of you have an opinion about this last election? You just have an opinion. How many of you don't have an opinion? <laughs> You're just like, I don't care. It's so weird. Um, guys, listen. Thankfully, God, God's got that. But guys, Paul is making the point. Don't be pulled into the evil schemes of this age. Guys, there's all kinds of messages that come. 
listen, I know, I know I look old for my age. I'm only 24. No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> What's up with that? I balded early, okay? I'm very young for my age. Uh, anyway. Listen, listen, listen. I know it's hard to believe, but just think with me. I know it's hard to believe. Um, I'm not 24. Because the, the longer, of course, that you live, the more things that you start learning and seeing. And, and guys, there's a lot of schemes that are coming your way that previous generations didn't have to worry about. Social media is a powerful one, guys. Um, be careful with that stuff. You know, I'm, I'm not going to preach a sermon about that because I do have, I've got, listen, you'll laugh. All I've got is Facebook. I know that's a little bit, you know, old school, uh, but I did get rid of MySpace. Um, <laughs> but uh, it, is, is that site even up anymore? I don't, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so Facebook's kind of old school. I, I go back and forth. Like, I'll delete the app for a while, and then I'll be like, you know, I got something to sell. I need Facebook Marketplace back. So, I'm, yeah, yeah. Hey, the other counselors are with me. Um, so, listen. But, guys, be careful about that. I'm not saying don't have it, but I'm saying you need to be careful. Especially when you get to flipping through reels. Guys, guess what? Those are not your friend. The people that control those messages are not your friend. The people that control those messages are not trying to point you to Jesus. So just be careful. Don't be pulled into the evil schemes of this age. So don't be conformed to this world. But this is the, most, this is the more important part of that. Not more important. Let me back it up. The whole verse is important. But this is what I really want you to, to make a note of. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. All right, so be transformed. Let's talk about the word transformed. I don't know how to pronounce Greek and Hebrew. I don't, I don't know how to do all that. But the word transform comes from the Greek word where we get more metamorphosis from. It's metamorpho something. Really don't know. What is metamorphosis? Like when we talk about metamorphosis, what typically comes to our mind? Butterfly. Butterfly comes to mind. Starts off as a caterpillar and it wraps itself in a cocoon. And then it emerges as a beautiful butterfly. How many of you like butterflies? Uh, listen, butterflies are great. Um, but listen, this is the idea that Paul is trying to come across when he says, be transformed. So, listen, this is a really, really encouraging note that I want you to write down. Everybody ready? Got your pens ready? This phrase, this word, transformed. Here's the encouraging phrase. It is in the present passive imperative. Tracking? No. Amen? Amen? Moving on? No. I'm just, I'm being silly, okay? It's kind of silly. Listen, but this is, this is actually really important that this word transformed is in the passive present imperative tense. Why is that so cool? This is pretty cool. Those of you that think English is totally uncool, this will actually make maybe a little cool. Why this is so important, guys, is that being that it's present means that it's ongoing. This transformation is ongoing. This is sanctification. Passive means that it is not something you do. So the passive, present tense of this word is that it's ongoing and it's not something you do. So if you're not doing it, who is? God working through the Holy Spirit in us. Guys, how many, listen, sometimes we can get so wrapped up in trying to do more for God physically. And that's made in our nature. I mean, we, we want to work hard and we want to do things that just kind of, we can, we can work and we can earn and we can make our own way. And that's just in our nature. But guys, when it comes to our sanctification, when it comes to our transformation, when it comes to you seeing the Lord working in your life, it's a work that He does, not you. 
So what does that tell us? What's our part to play in that? What's the word that comes to mind? What's our part to play? Surrender, exactly. As we talked about that last night, we're probably going to talk about it the rest of the weekend. But guys, surrender. Surrender is the part we play in this transformation. Surrender is the part that we play. What's the other, what's the other words in this, in, this, in this series of events? We're justified, right? What part do we play in our justification? Just surrender, right? Say, God, <laughs> I accept your payment for my sin. We just surrender to that. We accept it. Can we justify ourselves? No. Can we earn justification? No. Sanctification. What part do we play? God, I'm just, I'm giving you my whole self. I trust you with my whole self. I trust you with my future. We're surrendering. It's the work that he does. And guess what? After sanctification is complete, it's only complete when we open our eyes up in heaven. That's our glorification. And what part do we have to play in that? Nothing. Guys, surrender is so important in our life. Surrender. So the first big point that I made was our Father's trustworthy. The second one is God wants to do amazing things through you. So if we look at the end of verse number two, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good, acceptable, and perfect. So how many of you, be honest with me, how many of you really are struggling with knowing what is God's will for your life in the next? next phase or step. Good. Okay. How many of you maybe aren't struggling with it, but maybe you have in the past you've struggled with, hey God, what, what is your will? How many of you are confident in, I know what the Lord's will is for my next step? Just a couple of hands. Guys, that's okay. Thank you for being open. Listen, Scripture gives us a really, really good insight into how that can become more clear. It says, Living sacrifice. Don't be conformed to the, don't be pulled into the schemes of this age. Why don't we want to be pulled into the schemes of this age? Because it's going to, as a living sacrifice, what can a living sacrifice do? A sacrifice that's living and on top of the altar can actually crawl off the thing. <laughs> I've heard it put that way before. You can actually crawl off the altar. Hey, the evil schemes of this world are pulling at you. It's like, don't be conformed. Don't be pulled in. Let the Holy Spirit do His work in you through surrender. Continue to surrender. And guess what? That by testing you may discern what is the will of God. You want discernment in the will of God? Live in surrender. What does living in surrender look like? Living, this comes from an authentic living in the light surrender. Write that down. The sermon of God's will comes from authentic, living in the light surrender. So many cards were thrown up here this, uh, last night, and that was awesome to see. How many of those things since then have stayed in the dark, have stayed in the closet? I want to encourage you guys not to let those secret things stay secret. You are in a room full of people. This is an area of not, no condemnation in here. Guys, if there's something secret that you're struggling with, even if you feel like, you know what, it's going to change people's opinion of me, bring it into the light, guys. Discernment of the will of, will of God for your life comes from authentic living in the light. Surrender. Sometimes we think, I'm, I'm pretty surrendered, but... Just as Pastor Jeff talked about there, that little closet, that, little, that one little part that we're holding back. It's the, it's the future that we're really holding on to. It's that dream that we're holding on to. It's that relationship that we're really holding on to that we're not really willing to say, God, I give it to you. It's yours. I trust you with it. Because I'm going to encourage you as I, I would love. Romans chapter 12 is amazing. 
But the last thing that I want to give you is towards the end of the chapter. Starting in verse 9, I'm going to read this. I'm going to give you a few thoughts and then we'll, then we'll close. Verse 9, let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good, love one another with brotherly affection. Uh, do one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal, be fervent in spirit, serve the Lord, rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer, uh, contribute to the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality. We all want to experience genuine love, right? And all these statements are pretty good. Maybe they're hitting you as like, okay, I'm tracking with these, these are good, I'm feeling good about these things. But then we get into verse number 14. And it's just gotten done. Let's keep this in context, right? We didn't get to cover verses 3 through 8, but he talks about the amazing way that God has gifted each one of us. So he says, give your life as a living sacrifice. Live in authentic, in the light, surrender to a trustworthy God. And guess what? He's gifted you to be able to live that life. And then we get hit pretty hard in verse 14 with something that says, Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Be the humble. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. How many of you have been wronged or hurt by someone before? Now, come on. Come on. Come on. Every hand should be up. That was just a silly thing to do because we've all been there, right? We've all been hurt. We've all, and guys, guess what? Listen, our trustworthy God knows that some of the biggest hurts are ahead of you. But he's trustworthy with those things. But how, how hard is it for us to consider the fact that we are supposed to speak well of our enemies. You know, when it says here, bless those who persecute you, that word bless comes from the word where we get the word eulogize. So when somebody passes away and we have a funeral for them or we have a memorial service, there's somebody that comes up and gives a eulogy. Does that person come up during that eulogy and say, you know, this person laying in this casket was actually terrible. You know, they were actually an awful person and we're we're happy to be rid of this human. Do people talk like that at a funeral? Absolutely not. What What is a eulogy about? Honoring them? What else? The good things they did, right? Not every human is a total failure, okay? What's that? What else? Talk about the good. Yeah, exactly. And guys, listen. So when Scripture tells us to eulogize those who persecute us, those who give you a hard time, people that you would consider that are against you, there's something good about their life. There's something good that they do. For instance, little story. You just recently stopped working with, a, with an individual. He's no longer with my company. But this, this individual was extremely, extremely difficult to work with, so much so that I did not schedule any phone calls with him because it was just absolutely just uncomfortable. A very, very hard person to work with. And it's very easy for me to, when that name comes up, as it still does, to say, <laughs> <laughs> you got that right. Terrible, terrible person. So hard to work with. Let me tell you a story about a conversation I had with him. Really easy for me to do that. But, you know, I can also reflect on the fact that he's one of the most intelligent people I've ever met in my life. Studies hard, learns a lot, reads a lot of books, very passionate about what he believes in. Has there something good about even people that we would consider our enemies or those? That's, hey, listen, Paul's not saying to lie about people. Scripture is telling us to speak well of our enemies. Why? Because that is the result of authentic living in the light surrender because that brings humility into our life. Guys, all these things are, this is really important. This is the last point that I wanted to give you and we're done. 
seems kind of exhausting to speak well of people who do us wrong, right? Paul said in 2 Corinthians 12, 15, he said, I will very gladly spend and be spent for you. How many of you have that as a dream? I just want to be totally exhausted for people. That is my goal after high school. I want to be totally drained. And yeah, nobody, well, nobody wants that. Um, that'd be pretty messed up. But that's what Paul is actually telling these people that he loves. He's like, I will very gladly spend my life, just be totally spent for you. So write this down. Success is not accumulation. We have all these dreams, right? Houses, cars, things, gaming systems, right? We have all these things that we want to buy and, and have and do and places we want to go and travel and, and all these amazing things. Success is not accumulation, but in exhaustion. Success is not in accumulation, but in exhaustion. So, our Father is trustworthy. God has amazing things that He wants to do through you. And success is in exhaustion, not in accumulation. But what does that take? That takes authentic living in the light surrender. Trusting God with our future, with our dreams, with our hopes, with our desires. Trusting God with all of that and being willing to just hand it to Him and say, God, I trust you with it. As hard as it may be. And if you're in a place where there's something that you're holding back, talk to God about it. Even if you're still holding it back, talk to Him about it. He wants to walk through that with you. And He wants to lovingly show you His mercy and His grace. So let's live in the light, guys. Open that closet door. God loves you. We love you. Let's live in surrender. God, it's worth it. It's worth it to be exhausted for the cause of Christ. It's worth it to be exhausted for Jesus. It's worth it to be exhausted for those around us. It's worth it. Now, I'm exhausted, and I would encourage you, listen, the other message I had for you is how important it is from a Bible perspective to let your counselors get good sleep at night. But the Lord led me away from that message. Um, no, but guys, listen, none of us like to be physically exhausted, but when it comes to serving other people, and being willing to step into that, that comes from a heart that is truly, authentically living in the light surrender to the Lord.